202 Useful Exercises for IELTS Part 1 Listening Exercise 1.1 Listen to the following sentences, pausing your machine after each sentence to write down the essential details of what you have heard. A. Adelaide is the capital of South Australia. B. The city is often regarded as the cultural capital of the country. C. The annual Adelaide Festival attracts thousands of visitors from all around the world. D. Adelaide used to be called the city of churches. E. Rich farmers and landowners settled in the city last century. F. A conservative city for most of the year, Adelaide is quite trendy during the festival. G. The festival is a collection of interesting theatrical experiences from Australia and other countries. H. Although the attractions at the festival sometimes shock the locals, a good time is usually had by all. I. North of Adelaide, world-famous wines are produced in vineyards planted by German immigrants. J. For a small fee, tourists can visit Kangaroo Island, which is only a ferry ride from the capital. Exercise 1.2a. Write down the numbers you hear in the following sentences. 1. South Australia receives an annual rainfall of less than 250 millimetres, or 9.84 inches. 2. The initial settlement of South Australia began in 1834. 3. Adelaide's average annual rainfall is 585 millimetres, or 23.03 inches. 4. Its midsummer average maximum temperature is 28.5 degrees centigrade. 5. Its midwinter average maximum temperature is 15 degrees centigrade. 6. 72% of the South Australian population lives in Adelaide. 7. Temperatures in the opal town of Coobapedi in South Australia reach over 50 degrees in summer. 8. The wine-producing Barossa Valley is 50 kilometres from Adelaide via the Sturt Highway. 9. The Murray River, which almost reaches Adelaide, is 2,600 kilometres long. 10. The Adelaide Festival Centre stands on 1.5 hectares on the banks of the River Torrens. B. Spell correctly the names of the South Australian towns you hear. 1. I double N A M I N C K A. 2. W I L P E N A. Three. C double O N A L P Y N. Four. E D I T H B U R G H. Five. T U M B Y B A Y. Six. Double O D. N A D A double T A seven C double O N A W A double R A eight Q U O R N nine M O U N T G A M B I E R ten a R K A R Double O L A C Spell correctly the names of the following persons associated with South Australia one E D W A R D W A K E F I E L D two G O V E R N O R H I N D M A R S H 
three. S I R H E N R Y A Y E R S four. D O N A L D B R A D M A N five. E D M U N D W R I G H T six O H H A J E K seven C O L O N E L L I G H T eight S I R H A N S H E Y S E N nine S T R Z E L E C K I ten J A M E S H A R D Y D Write down the populations of the following South Australian towns. One, Coffin Bay, three hundred and forty-three. Two, Murray Bridge, twelve thousand seven hundred and twenty-five. Three, Mount Gambier, twenty-one thousand one hundred and fifty-three. Four, Narracourt. Four thousand seven hundred and eleven. Five. Loxton, three thousand three hundred and twenty-two. Six. Port Elliot, one thousand two hundred and three. Seven. Port Pirie, fourteen thousand one hundred and ten. Eight. McLaren Vale, one thousand four hundred and sixty-nine. Nine. Wyala. Twenty-five thousand five hundred and twenty-six. Ten. Gawler, thirteen thousand eight hundred and thirty-five. Exercise one point three, radio item one. In an Adelaide suburb last night, three masked gunmen forced their way into a self-service petrol station to find the police ready and waiting for them. But instead of arresting the men and charging them with armed robbery, they were given bottles of champagne to drink and large slices of cake. What was going on? Well, it was a case of you had to be there to understand that this was no ordinary robbery. It was all part of the start of the filming of the movie Break In, the South Australian Film Corporation's first joint venture made with the financial backing of a consortium of American movie studios known as the Hollywood Five. In recent years, Australian actors have been making world headlines and commanding big salaries. Consequently, overseas interest in their home country has increased enormously, a fact that hasn't escaped the South Australian Film Corporation. The Premier of South Australia, James Harding, believes that it's time big budget movies were made right here in Australia, creating hundreds of jobs, not only for actors and directors, but for technical crew members and other movie industry staff as well. If all goes according to plan, Break In, the first fifty million dollar movie ever made here, will be completed in February of next year. If successful, hopes are high for another six major movies to be made in South Australia over the next two years. Already, American movie stars are buying up land and houses in the Flinders Ranges north of Adelaide, and property values are soaring. It's just possible that Adelaide will shortly be known as the Hollywood of the South. Next Saturday, a party will be held to celebrate the formation of the company, and two free tickets are available to the first lucky listeners to ring this telephone number now: o o eight six four nine seven seven three five. That number once more is o o eight six four nine seven seven three five. Radio item two. 
the latest publishing craze, which has taken off all over the world, is the publication of what have come to be known as zines. Short, of course, for magazines. However, unlike magazines, whose fortunes ebb and flow, these thinner and less glossy zines can be desktop published at a greatly reduced cost. The first zine in Australia was a publication called Eddy, launched in Sydney in 1991 and still going strong. Zines are rather like comics, except that they also contain intelligent and often controversial articles on topics that interest today's highly educated youth. I spoke earlier today to Jean Cramp, the publisher of yet another Eddie clone called Fill Me In. Jean, can you tell us why you called your zine Fill Me In? Well, it's a joke, really. You know, most newspapers and magazines don't tell the whole story, or at any rate, they don't talk about issues that me and my friends want to know about. So that's why we started this zine, you see, to fill the reader in on the real news. So how well is your zine selling? Oh, great. In fact, it's only the fourth week of publication of the first issue, and we've had to reprint another 2,000. We've sold about 2,300 mostly in alternative bookshops that cater for people who are different. How, in fact, do you publish them? On a computer, all the graphic work and, of course, the word processing too. It's pretty simple, and there's only three of us in the publishing team. We work from our office, which is actually in the front room at home. We were all students together at Design College, you see. We've quit now to spend more time on it. Why do you think your zine is such a success? We tell it like it is, you know. We don't leave out any facts, and we don't tell lies like the other media. You know, current affair shows like this one, for instance. Thank you, uh, um, and well, I wish you all the best of luck with your uh, uh, zine, Jean. Exercise 1.8, Lecture 1. Can a new language be learnt in six weeks as some courses promise? Learning a language is not an easy task, though the reasons why it's so difficult cannot be explained without an understanding of how human language is acquired, and unfortunately, no one knows exactly how it is done. Linguists have many theories, but it is still a mystery, and one that may never be fully solved. Since hard and fast facts about first language acquisition are in short supply, it is not surprising to find that there are numerous competing theories on how best to learn a second or third language. One thing is certain, though, it doesn't happen overnight. Or does it? One theory that has been promoted for some years now is that of subliminal language learning, taking words into your mind while not consciously aware of them. Play a cassette tape of words and phrases you wish to learn while you are asleep, or perhaps while driving a car. It doesn't matter if you, if you listen to them or not, or even if the words are within your normal range of hearing. Your brain will hear the words and store them deep within your mind, ready for easier extraction when you practice certain exercises containing those words and phrases. The argument goes like this. When you learnt your own language, you had been spoken to and were constantly exposed to words in that language from the day you were born and possibly even before you were born. Yes, babies react to words spoken to them inside the mother's womb. This constant exposure ensured that the words were already planted in your mind before you actually learnt them. The subliminal method, then, is based on similar principles. Even having the TV or radio on all day in another language serves the same purpose but best results come from playing tapes with specially selected words and phrases over and over again. Recent surveys seem to indicate that early success in learning a foreign language requires at least two other conditions to be met. First of all, the range of vocabulary you need to learn should be restricted. It has been known for decades now that most of what one needs to say every day in the English language can be effectively communicated with a vocabulary of just 760 words. Secondly, the practice you do needs to focus on manipulations of those very same words. When starting to learn a language, reading the newspaper in that language is largely a waste of time. There are far too many new words to learn. Later, of course, reading all kinds of material in the new language is essential. 
Remember that learning a language is something you have already managed. All of us are constantly, if not always consciously, engaged in increasing the knowledge of our own language, and the language itself is changing slowly every day. Language learning is a part of everyone's daily life. The only real problem with most quick-fix language learning solutions is that they do not take into account one vital difference between the learning of one's first language and the learning of other languages. And that is, people who speak different languages actually think in very different ways. No wonder students are suspicious of six-week courses that promise the earth. Part 2 Listening Exercise 2.1 Listen to the following sentences, pausing your machine after each sentence to write down the essential details of what you have heard. A. Melbourne is the capital of the state of Victoria. B. The city is famous for its parks and vast network of trams. C. It is perhaps the most dignified and beautiful of all the Australian capital cities. D. Victoria is known as the Garden State. E. Environmental issues are important in this clean and green city. F. The water that supplies the city is from one of the purest sources in the world. G. Melbourne's Yarra River is clean but not clear. H. The Yarra River is said to flow upside down because it looks muddy. I. The locals who live close to bay beaches love to go swimming on the weekend. J. Melbourne is the nation's financial capital and Victoria produces about one-third of Australia's gross national product. Exercise 2.2a. Write down the numbers you hear in the following sentences. 1. The Dandenong Ranges are located 50 kilometres from Melbourne. 2. The Great Ocean Road runs for 320 kilometres along the southwest coast. 3. The city of Melbourne was founded in 1835. 4. Victoria was separated from New South Wales in 1851. 5. Melbourne had become Australia's largest city by the year 1861. 6. The city explorer leaves Flinders Street Station on the hour between 10am and 4pm. 7. One of the world's top racing events, the Melbourne Cup, is held during the city's three-and-a-half-week spring racing carnival early in November. 8. The Melbourne Cricket Ground can accommodate 110,000 people. 9. The Dandenong Ranges National Park is 1,900 hectares in size. 10. The Victorian Information Centre can be contacted on 03 790 B. Spell correctly the names of the Victorian towns you hear. 1. A-R-A-R-A-T 2. F-R-A-N-K-S-T-O-N 3. W-Y-C-H-E-P-R-O-O-F 4. B A C H U S M A R S H five R Y E six T R A R A L G O N seven D E R R I N A L U M eight P O R T S E A nine W A R R N A M B O L ten 
D I M B O O L A. C. Spell correctly the names of the following persons associated with Victoria. One. J O H N. B A T M A N. Two. J O H N. F A W. K N. E R. Three. C A P T A I N. J A M E S. C O O K. Four. A R T H U R. P H I W L -L I P. Five. N E D. K E. Double L Y. Six. B A R O N. V O N. M U E. Double L E R. Seven. W. R. G U I. L F O Y L E. Eight. S I D N E Y. M Y E R. Nine. D A V I D. J O N E S. Ten. H A R O L D. H O L T. D. Write down the populations of the following Victorian towns. One. Apollo Bay. Eight hundred ninety-four. Two. Ballarat, sixty-four thousand nine hundred and eighty. Three. Cowes, two thousand six hundred and fifty-eight. Four. Emerald, four thousand six hundred and ninety-three. Five. Portland, ten thousand one hundred and fifteen. Six. Swan Hill, nine thousand three hundred and fifty-seven. Seven, Wodonga, thirty-nine thousand nine hundred and seventy-five. Eight, Orbost, two thousand five hundred and fifteen. Nine, Kyneton, three thousand nine hundred and forty. Ten, Horsham, twelve thousand five hundred and fifty-two. Exercise two point three, radio item three. The mighty Snowy River, which flows through the mountainous southern regions of New South Wales, is sadly mighty no more. The image of the river as a powerful burst of water thundering through the natural mountain landscape is one that is known to almost all Australians, since the poet Banjo Paterson immortalised it in his epic poem, "The Man from Snowy River." There is little poetry, though, to be heard these days from the once proud but now strangled river. Fish populations have long since died. The river channel has narrowed dramatically and is choked by weeds and the roots of invading willow trees. The reason: less than one percent of the original river flow is released each year from the Jindabyne Dam, built in 1967, and part of one of Australia's grandest engineering feats. The Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Scheme. The dam has almost stilled the once roaring river, fed for much of the year by melting snows. The water, once it has been harnessed and used to power the turbines of the many electricity plants, is diverted to inland farms for irrigation purposes. The result: the slow death of a national treasure. Unfortunately, unless more water is released each year into the original river channel. The situation could become irreversible, but at last something is about to be done. The New South Wales government is beginning to realise that the future cost of regenerating the river, even if it were possible, could far outweigh the short-term expense, estimated at millions of dollars a year, of increasing the daily flow. It is truly a case of now or never for the river we have all come to know and love, our beloved Snowy River. Special project kits for interested schoolchildren, 
can be had by leaving your name and address with the operator on the following telephone number. 8 465 I'll repeat that number. 8 465 Radio item 4. Residents of the northern Queensland beachside town of Carsville, near the luxurious resort of Port Charles, were woken yesterday at 6.20am to the sound of a number of explosions that many were convinced was either a serious thunderstorm, blasts of gas, or even planes crashing into the sea. It turned out, however, that the sounds heard were actually part of a series of 25 controlled explosions set off approximately 200 metres offshore and conducted by marine authorities in an attempt to rid the sea of dangerous swarms of Portuguese man-of-war jellyfish that have been plaguing the local beaches for the past two years. No one is certain why the jellyfish have made a home in the once clear blue waters near the popular resort, but what is certain is that something had to be done. The town relies almost exclusively on the resort and tourism for its survival, but Carsville Beach has been strewn with the deadly jellyfish now for the last two summers, and fishing and bathing are no longer possible. Last year, the Shire Council decided to enlist the help of Professor Stephen Blunt, a marine biologist with the University of Northern Queensland, who proposed a controversial solution to the problem involving the foreshortening of the two-kilometre-long rock shelf that lies 200 metres out to sea. The shelf apparently traps the creatures before they have the chance to escape back to the ocean, and this, in turn, encourages them to increase in numbers. Global warming is thought to be at least partly responsible for slight changes in the recent patterns of moon tides, which have, however, been enough to upset the delicate natural balance allowing the jellyfish to reach the shore in numbers previously unheard of. By blasting away almost half of the rock shelf, Professor Blunt hopes the jellyfish will soon be a thing of the past. If the technique is successful, it may be used along other sensitive coastal waters of northern Queensland. Environmentalist groups are observing the experiment with caution. Exercise 2.8 Lecture 2. To be living in Australia in the late 20th century is to exist in one of the most advanced technological nations on Earth and yet be surrounded by countless opportunities to get close to the Earth, the sea and all the other wonders of the natural environment. Fortunately, the agricultural and industrial excesses of the past 50 years are beginning to be reversed and, with the establishment of vast areas of natural parkland, it is likely that the environment of much of the nation will remain untouched and unspoilt for decades to come. However, there is still much to be done and little room for complacency. Naturalists, for instance, are still baffled by the recent swift decline in the population of koalas. Kangaroos, on the other hand, once thought to be endangered, are actually increasing in numbers in certain areas of the outback faster than they can be controlled, causing millions of dollars damage to crops. Australian rivers and seas continue to be polluted by industrial waste and sewage, but there are signs that the education of the population to the dangers of unchecked consumerism is paying off. Perhaps the most encouraging sign is the recent change in political thinking even among the conservative elements of the major political parties. Though once there was believed to be little political sense in pushing environmental policies in elections, green political parties, with policies geared towards saving the environment, are supported by large numbers of electors and in some states hold the balance of power in Parliament. Most people are beginning to realise that Australia has a unique opportunity to lead the rest of the world in forming policies to deal with the protection of the environment. With a small population, it is possible to trial, at relatively little cost, various technological solutions to environmental problems that universally affect the planet. All indications are that these tough but necessary measures are finally being taken.
Part 3 Listening Exercise 3.1 Listen to the following sentences, pausing your machine after each sentence to write down the essential details of what you have heard. A. Perth is the capital of Western Australia. B. It is the most distant of all major cities in the entire world. C. Perth has the most perfect climate of all the capital cities of Australia. D. The city is situated on the Swan River. E. The SciTech Discovery Centre contains many science and technology displays. F. Gold was first discovered in Western Australia late last century. G. Water is piped an amazing 563 kilometres from Perth to the gold mines. H. Kalgoorlie, the largest gold mining town, still produces gold. I. The largest mine is the most technologically advanced in Australia. J. The golden mile that surrounds the town was once considered to be the richest square mile on earth. Exercise 3.2 A. Write down the numbers you hear in the following sentences. 1. The average maximum temperature in winter is 18 degrees centigrade. 2. The average year-round temperature is 23 degrees centigrade with 8 hours of sunshine a day. 3. The city of Perth was founded in 1829. 4. The population of Perth is approximately a million. 5. Gold was discovered in Kalgoorlie in 1893. 6. The Kalgoorlie Boulder region has produced over 1,300 tonnes of gold. 7. Kalgoorlie is 597 kilometres east of Perth. 8. At the height of its operation, the mining town was home to almost 100 hotels. 9. Today, there are only 13 hotels serving the town. 10. Tourist information regarding Kalgoorlie is available by telephoning 090-21-1966. B. Spell correctly the names of the Western Australian towns you hear. 1. K-A-M-B-A-L-D-A 2. D-U-M-B-L-E-Y-U-N-G 3. Y-A-L-L-I-N-G-U-P 4. E S P E R A N C E. 5. C R A N B R Double O K. 6. M A R B L E B A R. 7. R O C K I N G. H A M eight A L B A N Y nine D O double N Y B R double O K ten G A S C O Y N E J U N C T I O N C. Spell correctly the names of the following persons associated with Western Australia. 1. D I R K H A R T O G. 2. W I L L E M D E V L A M I N G H 3 C A P T A I N 
J A M E S S T I R L I N G. Four. W I L L I A M S H A K E S P E A R E. Five. P A Double D Y H A Double N A N Six C H A R L E S F R E M A N T L E Seven C Y O Apostrophe C O double N O R eight J O H N F O double R E S T nine E D M U N D L O C K Y E R ten E D W A R D J O H N E Y R E D. Write down the populations of the following Western Australian towns. One, Dampier, one thousand eight hundred and ten. Two, Bunbury, twenty four thousand and three. Three, Kalgoorlie Boulder, twenty-five thousand and sixteen. Four, Wanneroo, six thousand seven hundred and forty-five. Five, Katanning, four thousand one hundred and thirty-nine. Six, Fremantle, twenty-seven thousand and thirty-four. Seven, Marble Bar. Three hundred and eighty-three. Eight. Geraldton, twenty-four thousand three hundred and sixty-one. Nine. Mandurah, twenty-three thousand three hundred and forty-three. Ten. Wittenoom, fifty. Exercise three point three, radio item five. Welcome to Software World, bringing you the very latest information on what is currently available on CD-ROM. Are you a director or producer looking for an unusual actor to play a part in a new movie project, or with that special look for a new commercial on TV? Okay, the usual procedure would be to contact a theatrical agency, who would try and sell you the idea of using one of the actors listed on their books. Books. Too old-fashioned for you? Then get yourself a copy of this latest electronic database called the Electronic Curtain. The brainchild of casting agent Fred Harkney of the Better Talent Agency, he says he got the idea of an actor's directory from his son playing computer games. Noting that Junior had to type in the details of the characters in his favourite game, he realised he could do the same for the actors he represents. Eventually, he came to include information on nearly three quarters of the five thousand actors registered and looking for work in Australia. With some agencies boasting that they represent over four hundred actors, the need for this product is not hard to fathom. It can be a nightmare trying to remember just which actor has done what, or just what an actor can do. The database lists details of over 3,500 performers, TV shows they have appeared in, special skills they possess, everything down to the colour of their eyes and other distinguishing physical features. By entering the details of the type of person you are looking for, the database quickly locates only those persons with the particular qualities requested. One problem, though. Is that many actors feel it is too impersonal, and they could be missing out on much-needed auditions for parts in shows. 
On the other hand, it might just get them that elusive job. The days of nervous nail-biting while waiting around to give an audition could well and truly be over, and all because of a small plastic disc. For product details, ring this number now, 9433-6588. That number again, 9433-6588. Radio Item 6 Welcome to Inventor's Corner. This week we take a look at an invention that may well change the way in which you listen to your television set. Four years and $20,000 later, Susan Schofield of Perth believes she has the answer to that nagging problem of listening to commercials at twice the volume of the program you are watching. Annoyed at having to reach for the remote control, Every time an advertisement comes on the screen, simply to avoid being deafened, she came up with the idea of a small device that detects when an ad is being shown and automatically reduces the volume to a preset level. Why not cut out the sound completely? Well, that's possible if you wish, but too often, of course, the viewer misses the first few seconds of the show returning to the screen. Now, the volume is totally at your control. Just how the device works is a patented secret, but together with her husband, a television repairman by trade, she was able to create an electronic box no bigger than your thumb that attaches to the back of the remote control itself. The only drawback is the remote must always be pointed directly at the TV set. However, Susan doesn't think this will detract from its selling power, and Susan ought to know. It was she who invented that other best-selling gadget we featured on the show two years ago. I refer, of course, to the telephone answering machine that automatically answers with a message that changes depending on the voice of the caller. Looks like Susan's done it again with what she calls the ad subtractor. Exercise 3.8. Dictation 1. Air pollution is probably the modern world's greatest threat. Water can be filtered, land can be cleared, but filthy air can only be filtered by the nose and lungs. It is estimated that living in a big city is equivalent to smoking half a packet of cigarettes a day. What is more, the most dangerous components of air pollution are invisible gases. We cannot smell or see the dangerous gases given off from the exhausts of cars, trucks and buses. However, this does not mean they are not present in our bloodstream every time we take a breath. It is obvious that our future health depends on the development of a safer vehicle engine. Air pollution. Is probably the modern world's greatest threat. Water can be filtered, land can be cleared, but filthy air can only be filtered by the nose and lungs. It is estimated that living in a big city is equivalent to smoking half a packet of cigarettes a day.
What is more? The most dangerous components of air pollution are invisible gases. We cannot smell or see. The dangerous gases given off from the exhausts of cars, trucks and buses. However, this does not mean they are not present in our bloodstream every time we take a breath it is obvious that our future health depends on the development of a safer vehicle engine.